Okay, so um, uh, afternoon everyone and thanks to the Architecture Foundation for uh, letting us uh, kind of uh, be part of the this initiative. Um, I might actually uh, just switch my camera off um, just whilst we talk. Um, okay, so uh, this afternoon we're going to be talking about Collaborative Concrete, which is a series of projects that uh, we've been uh, kind of overseeing and leading as part of a collab uh, module as part of the school. And so it's kind of uh, based on a number of um, uh, kind of projects that we've worked with uh, different students across different levels and courses in uh, School of uh, Architecture and Design and the School of School of Art. So I'm Senior Lecturer and Course Director on the Postgraduate MR course. And uh, Mike, if you wanted yeah. to. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm an architect, uh, an architect, um, uh, a lecturer at the School of Architecture and Design. Um, I lead a, a design studio um, on the MArch course, which is the master's course. Um, I'm also doing a PhD at the School of Architecture and Design on the civic ground of institutions and infrastructure. And I've got a variety of interests in all things uh, modernist in Birmingham, so co-founded the Modernist Society uh, a few years back, published a map on the city, modernist map of the city, um, and write for the uh, modernist magazine, 20th Century Society and the likes. Um, so yeah, I've been part of collaborative projects probably for about 10 years with the School of Art um, as part of our university initially working with an artist called Stuart Whips, who I'm still doing stuff with uh, whenever I can. Um, and my, uh, my uh, Instagram handle is mid underscore underscore mod, which is on the screen there. And Gareth? Yeah, hi. Um, my name's Gareth Proscreen Barnett and I'm a senior lecturer at the, at the School of Art. Um, I'm the coordinator for level six, which is the third year. Um, and teach into both the art and design BA and the fine art BA, but predominantly within within art and design. Um, and yeah, I, I think similar to kind of both Mike and Alessandra, I'm a, a sort of been really interested in kind of collaboration um, and kind of collaborative projects and how we bring that into the school. Um, so, and yeah, she, Mike's just mentioned Stuart, who's someone I work closely with as well. Um, yeah, in developing those. Okay, so um, kind of following on from um, the kind of theme of collaboration or the topic of collaboration. So um, uh, for a bit of context, uh, the School of Art and the School of Architecture, um, as it was known then, uh, has a kind of long history of kind of uh, working together, but also being located together. Um, so this is an excerpt from uh, the 1960s, the journal, um, and the Margaret Street um, building where um, the School of Architecture originated from as kind of evening classes before it became an official school. But one of um, the most prominent grads uh, from the school in the 50s was John, uh, John Maiden, um, who uh, had a real uh, impact on, on the city uh, in his subsequent work afterwards. So this, the because the family are now here. growing up and we shall want to spend more time with them. But as far as planning and architecture are concerned, I think what I'd really like to do is to design a town from the beginning to the end. That is, planning the town and taking the development of the town right through to the completion of all the buildings. Um, I hope the audio was okay with that. Thanks. Great. Um, so there you, there you have it. There's John Maiden in his... Uh, with megalomaniac kind of tendencies but um, so kind of following on from that in the 1950s uh, the School of Architecture had it was kind of pioneering this idea of life projects um, initially kind of working uh, school uh, school of architecture students working with the city council on uh, live projects as we know it now um, but at the time was a very innovative kind of teaching model um, so there's a huge kind of kind of history and back catalogue of, of buildings in the, in the city built by uh, or designed by students. But we, we resurrected uh, live projects uh, back in 2011 in what was a, a more traditional form of um, a live project format that 
uh, is quite common in schools of architecture. But I think being in a faculty of uh, art and design and media, um, we've kind of, over the years, it's transformed into a more of a transdisciplinary work. Um, so uh, the work that we're going to, to kind of, and the projects that we're gonna focus on uh, this afternoon is gonna sample a bit of that uh, transdisciplinarity between uh, art and architecture and how we've interpreted the changes in the city going on. So we have um, five projects, uh, which are across two sites. So the first one is the Central Library or the former Central Library um, in uh, the city centre. And then we uh, also touch on the flyover um, just north of the city centre. So the projects have a relationship between architecture, identity and infrastructure. And it's about the kind of change between tactile and immaterial sculpture. So um, uh, it's kind of like a quote which I really like, it's like the slow cancellation of the future, which is by Franco Berardi. So um, we'll kind of explore some of these now. Um, so to put you in, in the context, these are some um, archival uh, kind of drawings of uh, Birmingham Central Library. Uh, built as a, a kind of civic institution um, in the post-war period of, of Birmingham. It was uh, designed as a as this kind of uh, key piece of kind of civic infrastructure for the city so you can kind of see it sprawling uh, far beyond um, just a, a library and it housed a number of or it was meant to house a number of different institutions and it was a, a kind of symbol of its age um, uh, and um, met with uh, kind of uh, kind of glee uh, and um, astonishment in kind of equal measures, um, and so these are just kind of some of the samples of the of the interior. Um, I think what, what might also be worth adding in in relationship to to this is that, as you can see from this photograph, that there was major um, uh, reworkings of the city's fabric from. Well, really, from uh, the post-war period onwards, where uh, the ring road, which had been planned from about 1917, actually turned into something quite substantially different, and referred to um, uh, American forms of infrastructure planning rather than what had previously been conceived as European boulevards and, and specifically the Viennese Ringstrasse. So it's a quite a, a, a major shift in the thinking about the form of that. That infrastructure and, and actually Central Library um, was at the nexus of a number of um, systems and flows within the city which uh, which you can is really quite evident from this so you get the, the sort of neoclassical uh, remnants to the bottom of that photograph and then um, a reconceptualization of the city as, as a space or a, a kind of nexus of, of movement flows with Central Library at its, at its core. So, so we've been able to kind of gather some uh, fragments, archival fragments, some which we've just shown you, um, and others uh, which are more uh, we've put together. So these are stills from Derek um, Fairweather, is showing the um, the demolition of the kind of Victorian institutions uh, and the build up of uh, the kind of brutalist architecture, which was um, uh, more contemporary of its time. And then some other diagrams just showing the, the kind of principle or the party diagram of, of the idea of flows um, uh, between one part of the city to another. Um, but um, due to kind of pressures of uh, kind of redevelopment and economic change, um, Central Library um, had this kind of uh, generated this love-hate relationship with, with its residents. Um, and was kind of quite brutally demolished um, in, I think it started in 2014. And there were some similarities with Robin Hood uh, Garden. So you can see a video playing there uh, just from the VNA website. Um, the idea of um, it being revered as a seminal piece of uh, kind of mid century architecture attempted to be listed but failed. Um, and being demolished uh, under kind of um, the stresses of kind of economic uh, redevelopment. And Central Library has been captured by, um, you know, it's, 
it's kind of been captured by the imagination of lots of artists um, in, in the region. Um, so this is the demolition of uh, Central Library captured by David Rowan, who's a, an artist and photographer that works in, in, in the West Midlands. Um, but it was demolished in a very public manner in the city centre. And um, Alison and Peter Smithson, they, they presented Robin Hood Gardens in, um, in the, the Venice Biennale, the Art Biennale in 1976. And they, uh, they talked about a building under assembly as a, a ruin in reverse. So this is kind of one of the uh, uh, kind of factors that we're gonna kind of touch upon um, for the rest of the talk. So as part of that redevelopment, we, uh, we entered a, uh, an ROBA competition. It was a public competition for Centenary Square, which is just in front of uh, Central Library. Um, so here in Centenary Square, which is surrounded by the Symphony Hall, uh, the Rep Building and Baskerville House. So it's, a, it's an assemblage of um, various kind of civic institutions. We, we also have Alpha Tower here, which is also modelled on um, the Pirelli Tower in Milan, and then the Municipal Bank. So it's a it's an interesting kind of location. Um, but our approach to this um, program was taking the as as the building was due to be demolished, we took this kind of bricolage approach to the architecture as well, and kind of taking sections through it, um, not that dissimilar to uh, Gordon Matter Clark, but then kind of um, strewing it across. Uh, Centenary Square as it responds to um, uh, different kind of site conditions and there were lots of kind of public artworks over the decades that have uh, uh, remained in Centenary Square so we use those as kind of nodal points to, to kind of reference our fragments around and so even the way that we produced the drawings we um, created this bricolage effect and we had these we wanted to propose three rooms, so that the civic, um, the collective and the individual room based with these kind of fragments of central library. There's, um, there's a, a great quote from the uh, Irene Scalbert uh, text uh, on 6A Architects about the architect Bricola who sniffs around, rummages through old things, through materials and artifacts, as well as ideas and concepts and interrogates the heterogeneous objects that constitute the treasury, seeking to discover what each of them could signify. So I think we're, we're really interested in quite an open-ended approach to the idea of bricolage and, and to see what the site offers up in terms of its history uh, and an understanding of that history, not only in an aesthetic sense, but, but also in the social relationships that emerge from that. So as Alessandro just mentioned, the idea of the three rooms at different scales um, formed a significant part of our, our thinking on, on this project. Um, so we'll just kind of go flip through like just a sequence of drawings that we, we built up over time. And we were working with a, um, a student, Miles as well. He was a recent graduate at the time. Uh, Miles Marshall and so we kind of built up uh, these layers from uh, existing kind of archival uh, drawings or artifacts that we found of the city centre and kind of slowly building up our proposal of these three rooms you can see the civic the collective and the individual as uh, the individuals kind of based on this kind of reflective garden where we had the the centenary um, kind of memorial um, located and I think there, there's another another part of this that was really important in, in terms of the the act of layering because I think what part of our critique was that Birmingham's not particularly good at layering. It tends to uh, have a position of of reinventing itself uh, on a on a 50 year cycle. And and so things like Tess Jarre's uh, 1988 com commission for the uh, the carpet remains as an element within the square. So rather than obliterating it and decommissioning it entirely, as, as actually has happened since, we propose keeping fragments of these things so that actually, as a, as a citizen of Birmingham or as a visitor indeed, that you can actually start to read some of those layers of that history in that space. And then to also incorporate more recent um, 
sculptures like Gillian Waring's Royal Birmingham Family becomes a really significant um, piece of artwork within, within that square. So these, these are just the, the final drawings um, of the proposal. Um, but needless to say, we didn't win. Um, but uh, kind of through that process, we, we gathered uh, a whole host of uh, our own images, uh, photographs and drawings, but also we had a, a whole kind of, um, kind of catalogue of archival work that we gathered. There's Gareth kind of a, uh, assessing the concrete very closely. Um, and uh, we wanted to, to kind of uh, bring all this kind of work um, and present it in a, in a public domain and forum. We felt as, as we were lecturers in the School of Arch Architecture at the time, we, it, was, it was almost like a duty to present um, some of the ideas that uh, are kind of being overwritten um, as a result of the redevelopment. So we were looking at kind of capturing these in a, a number of forms and in particular uh, kind of short form um and using gifs um, and moving image to to kind of uh grab small snapshots of of different ideas and aspects of of the building and how it was kind of going for a change um so the short narratives doesn't necessarily mean that they're any less powerful um but what we wanted to do is to create uh, new narratives uh one of kind of what mike mike was saying about uh, layering or the kind of uh, the ideas and the benefits to layering. And so that's kind of reflected in the way that we're representing um, architectural ideas too. Um, so we wanted to present this in a public form. And um, so we, we asked, uh, um, to arrange a Kind of opening uh, kind of preview nights um so it's it's Might kind of a bit of that alessandra i think we got blasted out by the music at the start <laughs> oh sorry <laughs> um uh, we we wanted to present the work in a public forum so uh we asked eastside projects which is an artist-led gallery um in digworth uh, in the creative part of the creative quarter of the city um to to arrange a specific audiovisual night um and again, it's what we wanted to do is to kind of bring some of those short narratives in a more spatial uh, and kind of atmospheric experience. Uh, and we called it um, Unpublic Works. I'll just kind of read out a quote from it. Um, Unpublic Works was an audiovisual deconstruction of Motopia. Birmingham's obsession with progress, production and change is illustrated through the construction and demolition of some of the city's finest brutalist landscapes. Unpublic works celebrated a collective vision for the future city, one that's lost to the bulldozer and the other emergent from the dust. So um, we, we kind of, we use a number of different methods to, to, to kind of uh, capture all these short narratives. Um, and so it was in the collective of these narratives where you start to build up a picture of of what's kind of going on and so it's, it's up to the audience to interpret um, the ideas of change and, and kind of progress and um, interestingly uh, looking back on it for this talk we kind of realized that we we forgot that we actually captured a lot of uh, different uh, artifacts and fragments using uh, various digital apps that you can download and it captures not just the physical but also kind of surface treatment and kind of graffiti and so on so um, <clears throat> uh, in preparing for this we we're reading Francesca Gavin who's a curator and talks about um, how information through social media we're capturing uh, kind of cultural and social moments as well so it kind of reminded me of um, uh, Robert Lee's monument um, that's recently been kind of uploaded on Sketchfab and you can kind of interact with it in a number of ways to, to, to see it for what it is as a kind of monument, but also as something that has uh, uh, changed meaning over time.
So that was a kind of project that uh, myself and Michael and Miles worked on. So now we're going to go on to looking at uh, the first project where we engage with a student group as part of the, the CoLab module. Uh, Mike's going to start talking through this. Yeah. Thank you, Alessandro. So this project was called Downtown is for People. And um, the, the title is taken from um, an essay of the same title in Jane Jacobs' book, Exploding Metropolis, which was the precursor to the death and life of the great American city. And in that, she said that um, good planning actually leaves room for the incongruous, the vulgar or the strange. So we were in a similar way to um, the project we just talked about. We we're actually suggesting that the uh, modernist iconoclasm that is taking place in Birmingham needs to be reviewed and, and questioned really. So through a process of examining the conditions um, surrounding the redevelopment of Paradise Circus as it's known, so now, now known as Paradise actually. We're actually interested in how we can uh, capture remnants of, of the site and to um, explore the idea of the, the, the memory of that site and, and to make a, an, an archival collection. The initial proposition was actually to make an exhibition in the undercroft of the library, but um, for various um, health and safety reasons that didn't take, that didn't take place. But nonetheless, we, we used that as a starting point for progressing um, the idea of an installation that brought together some of those digital explorations. Um, so the, uh, the ideas um, were really focused on um, how we can start to think about the memory of those artifacts or those spaces. And we were really interested in, again, in, in some of the work that came out of the 2018 Venice Biennale, uh, which looked at, um, was called uh, A World of Fragile Parts, um, which suggested that the 3D digital model is the new plaster cast. Um, yeah, much more powerful in its ability to be spread and to be shared. So in the process, we, uh, we undertook visits to things like the V&A cast courts and looked at what the contemporary um, condition of that might be. So uh, Oliver Pickering, one of the students from the group, became really interested in the opportunities of photogrammetry. And so this is, uh, this is actually the, the cover and, uh, and inner sheets from his, present, his um, submission where he's, he's got a scan of the central library building partway through demolition, but also um, superimposed on that is um, a scan of King Kong, which was a 1970s artwork by an artist called Nicholas Monroe, which was part of the um, Stuyvesant Foundation's um, art installation. Um, so um, we collaborated on, on making some scans of both of those those um, buildings but and then there's this, I suppose this question of of what you do with that that next so these are some images of the well the source material so the the moving image on the bottom right hand side is actually the dro the uh, drone images from the demolition contractors for Central Library that we sliced up into a series of still images and, and actually subverted the original intention original intention of the video is sort of a celebratory video of the end of Central Library. We've turned that into more or less a monument to that moment of its demolition. So through the process of photogrammetry, we've created a, a three-dimensional model, digital model of that, that has its inconsistencies, it has gaps in it, but actually it's a quite a truthful um, uh, rendition of that moment in time. I think that the idea of a moment uh, in time is a really important part of it. So there, there's also the idea of um, uh, the kind of the poor image that it, it creates as well. So um, kind of quoting Hito Stale, who's an art, a German uh, based artist, who talks about the kind of poor image is a copy in motion and uh, as it accelerates, it deteriorates. Um, uh, and so the poor image tends towards abstraction. So it's kind of what we uh, uncovered as we were kind of going through these uh, technical processes. You can see in the top uh, right image, the, the quality starts to deteriorate and, and it starts to gather its own kind of qu aesthetic qualities as well from it. And um, so, um, as I mentioned previously, we, we had intended to install the exhibition in the undercroft of the library, but actually 
we scaled it uh, to suit um, the offices of a local practice called K4 Architects, who are based in Digbeth, um, not so far from Eastside Projects. Um, and then this, this became a, an installation, sort of an interactive installation where we presented the process work and drew on a number of key quotes that we'd explored during the project. So uh, Jane Jacobs quote, uh, was quotes by um, Alexandra Lang uh, talking about too lively a finger on the delete button robs the present of meaning in the past of its of presences. But also we found um, uh, Sam Jacobs uh, discussion around the culture of copying very interesting about um, how might the proliferation of digital copies digital copies begin to transform the physical world? What are the interfaces between the virtual and the real? I think that that seems really pertinent at the moment for, for a lot of reasons. Um, so there's a question really about what the future of a museum or a collection, an archive collection might look like. And, and so we started to explore that through through some of these processes. So these are these are some screen grabs of, of the actual photogrammetry process which you know is becoming more and more accessible um, every every uh, every year that goes by really so this is these are some elements of um, the Sam Jacobs quote um, uh, yeah and so these are then some images of the actual installation so you can probably just see on the left hand side there's a there was a tabletop um, and that was a combination of physical replicas of um, John Maiden's now demolished because a lot of John Maiden's buildings are unfortunately demolished. Post and mail building, which was described as a little bit of Manhattan in Birmingham. So we, we made multiples of them. So it's sort of read almost as if, uh, as a, an art multiple. But then through overlaying a digital camera onto that, we're able to use uh, digital markers, which are those squares with patterns in, which could then be redistributed around the table. So this, I suppose, a commentary on the notion of um, planning processes and democratized planning about how you could actually start to use digital tools to open up discussion about what the shape and orientation of buildings might be. So you can say it's slightly glitchy and we, I think we, uh, we, we like the idea of a slightly glitch, um, glitchy technology because it shows that it's an emerging uh, technology and it's not perfect but you can see as, as the process goes on the city becomes increasingly messy whereas actually I don't think any of the uh, physical sculptures were actually moved interestingly um, so yeah I think there's there's some real really interesting opportunities for both archival practice but also uh, planning practice um, yeah this is Wait for these to be a bit quieter. I don't know if you can still hear me over the, the music there, but yeah, 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 in, yeah. in my own practice, um, as part of um, membership of something called Black Hole Club in, in Birmingham, um, I started to get more interested in how these um, artifacts could be composed and how post production might actually start to turn it into um, uh, a media in its own right. So these are two films that I made as part of that um, um, uh, membership of Black Hole Club with Vivid. Um, and they look at these photogrammetry pieces of data, but then start to overlay different pieces of information. So the video on the left hand side is uh, Central Library um, with an overlay of the, the, the kind of plan form um, interspersed. And then on the right hand side, is um, some elements of Kevin Lynch's view from the road, um, again referencing the the notion of uh, townscape from the car that uh, Kevin Lynch was uh, very instrumental in in um, uh, theorising during the 1960s, which Birmingham uh, learned uh, and borrowed from heavily, even though it's actually uh, Kevin Lynch's text was actually heavily based on Gordon Cullen's um, European townscape. Okay. Um, um, so the uh, the next project is uh, grade separation, which we followed up with, um, and um, our students were working with uh, Hockley, no, responding to Hockley flyover, 
and the, the, the kind of idea of grade separation, which is a, a term that refers to like the separation of vehicular uh, traffic from pedestrian uh, kind of routes. Um, so kind of designs um, are quite often in kind of post-war uh, uh, reconstruction of cities with the idea of safety and efficiency of movement. Uh, but actually what happened was is that the road overwhelmed uh, the context and you can kind of see here so um, <clears throat> so the city center is about uh, maybe like a, a 10 minute drive uh, from from this uh, from this ring road and you can see a uh, hockley fly over there and you can just see um, the our area of focus so as part of the the scheme of um, this infrastructural project was to was to humanize uh, the, the spaces underneath and uh, a number of kind of public artworks were commissioned. And so Hockley Flyover has a, an amazing piece of work by Bill Mitchell, this kind of uh, uh, sculptural relief that you can see um, here. Um, so, so our students uh, this year or that year, they responded to, the, to this context um, using some of the similar processes that we've been kind of building up over the years. So originally it was designed as a, a kind of, a notional kind of a play or kind of climbing wall uh, by Bill Mitchell. They kind of see here, and this is Seb, one of our students um, uh, from back when, uh, kind of imitating uh, that task. And uh, the students collected a number of kind of primary and secondary sources. So they actually went to um, Bill's apartment in, in Marlebone in London to, to kind of interview him and understand firsthand his ideas and, and process. So uh, I'll play an excerpt in a second. Um, but we, uh, it, again, like the library, it, it kind of captures the imagination of the community really strongly, um, even though it's, it's relatively uh, kind of seen as an undesirable environment. Um, uh, so we have um, Tracy Fawn that goes by the name of Ghost Streets. Uh, she's uh, undertaken a, a kind of intricate photo essay of, of this as an infrastructural project, but also kind of commissions um, art projects within, uh, within the space or within the environment to, to kind of display different artworks. So the community really kind of grabbed hold of this uh, residual bit of infrastructure. And also Soweto Kinch, who's a quite a well-known uh, a British jazz artist from the West Midlands. Um, he runs a festival here every year, um, so, so kind of promoting local uh, music from the community. So the idea of infrastructure kind of takes on a slightly different role um, as it's been adopted by different people over, over the decades since it's been built. Um, <clears throat> so these are some of the, the kind of fragments that the students have kind of collected um, as, as a starting point so we, we tasked them off to go to the uh, central uh, library kind of collections and see what was gathered to understand the kind of political context um, of, uh, of what they were dealing with uh, before they created any, any responses or creative responses. Um, so the next slide, it kind of shows a fragment or a section of um, the interview with Bill Mitchell. So I'm just going to play this for... Uh, uh, for a few seconds. Hopefully it's not too loud. It's a difficult trip and nothing to do with doing it. That's easy. You've got parts of Birmingham that is typically Birmingham. That's what you should talk about. Never mind the politics of it. I guess. Why is Birmingham so bloody boring? The choices in the Papua are very limited and they've got to be related, if you want to be successful, to what people are themselves familiar I always found that if you use what class of men, four parts that, and you smeared those on the wall, it became a piece of paper and you could draw what you um, I hope the audio was okay um, transmitting. Um, yeah, but we, we love that quote of kind of him talking about the politics and then kind of 
uh, Birmingham with this perception of it being boring. Um, you know, we're, we're quite self-deprecating in nature. Um, but there's this kind of political uh, backdrop to, uh, to his commission as well that, um, that he clearly wanted to avoid. And actually there was almost this automatic process of, of playing and casting that he created in these relief halls. So um, Anila and, and Seb Smart, they, um, they interspersed the interview um, with various kind of personal recordings of, of the video. And we'll be able to see that's very similar to a BBC drama um, that we'll show in a, in a second. So, um, just before we move on, on to that, I think what, what was quite interesting with this in terms of building up an archive is that the site becomes uh, the, the, the subjects of that consideration, but we were very much interested in, in the minutiae of the site. So from uh, the details that can be found in the material, but also in terms of its urban composition, as a piece of urban infrastructure that has been uh, purposefully designed as a, an engaging space, but also in the, the slightly less intangible aspects of it. So we have students looking at um, soundscaping, um, in casting, in, in video making, which we'll have a look at in just a moment. So I think what, what we tried to do with this project was um, bring some more uh, haptical, tactile, elements to to complement the digital work or the digital exploration um, uh, so michael saying soundscapes we'll show that in a second but also screen printing uh, as well students kind of develop screen printing techniques and the idea of layering and this one on the on the far right has actually got a narrative text as well so they're built up uh, again uh, representing ideas which uh, of the city and kind of uh, applying them and kind of metaphorically to their creative outputs. Um, and some of the soundscapes that we, uh, we refer to, unfortunately we don't have the audio clip to, to play you, but what, um, what happened was that some of the students kind of worked together. So Faye uh, was working on pro um, producing these soundscapes and Josh Wickens was interested in um, kind of a gaming atmosphere so he created a, a unity environment where you could kind of walk around and interact with as a game and so the the kind of soundscape was imported as part of that um, <clears throat> so it talks about um, you know so we're using digital explorations to combine kind of touch and sound uh, but without necessarily having a tactile environment or objects to touch um, and there's a there's a discussion around kind of lost futures and how how technology can stabilize the change that we're experiencing by the way that we capture fragments so whether they're in audio clips or uh, kind of physical fragments that we we kind of scan and reprint uh, or we digitize entirely and so this is just a, a selection uh, more screenshots of the photogrammetry process and what's interesting is, um, so the image on the, on, the, on the left was created by Peter Fanfor. Uh, he, um, through the archival clip uh, from British Pathé of Bill Mitchell's uh, process, he uh, repeated that and tried to learn about how that process, kind of all those decades ago, how he, he created a, a, a section of the relief wall. Um, so it kind of reminded us of, uh, the original intention of what the cast courts and the VNA were meant to be about is that educational purpose uh, of learning through a kind of copying and, and repetition. Um, we didn't uh, necessarily present that work in any kind of public forum, but the next one we, we were able to. Uh, so Concrete RIP, I'll let uh, Gareth now kind of talk um, through this project. If he's there. Yeah, thanks Alexander. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, Concrete RIP is, I guess basically it's, it's an open access archive of digitised concrete fragments from the Central Library um, that were collected at the time of its, of its demolition. Um, so there's kind of 3D scans of the concrete debris are, are kind of made available through this website, uh, concrete.rip. Um, with the idea that they can be, that they become these kind of mutant copies 
that they're available to download, reuse, repurpose. Um, and with that, providing an opportunity to rethink our relationship both to concrete and the, the kind of brutalist utopias from which that concrete came from. So this archive has been presented at uh, the Reform Design Biennale in Denmark um, and at the V&A Digital Futures. And it's since been developed through a, a number of different iterations um, for projects at Grand Union in Birmingham, uh, the New Art Gallery Warsaw, um, and last year at a residency at Planet in Changsha, China, um, where I was imagining the concrete fragment. Um, yeah, I kind of wrote this science fiction narrative about it traveling to, to China to meet a material called BSB core, which had been developed as a, as a sort of an alternative to concrete um, by, uh, by, by BSB group, um, a company out in, in Changsha. Um, I think it's kind of really interesting in this idea of what happens when brutalism or kind of, you know, materials move through and beyond computer networks and how they become unstable and porous, susceptible to distortion. Um, and with that, they kind of open up new narrative possibilities. And there's, there's something really kind of, you know, speculative about that. It's like, what can this, what can this become? Um, so, so yeah, so I think when a, when a concrete fragment is, oh, if you just go back to the, oh, Alessandro, sorry. Yeah, so when a concrete fragment is 3D scanned, it kind of rematerializes as, as both a, a sort of an object file, but also as a JPEG and an MTL. And these three files combine to replicate the fragment through the screen. Um, although you could say that this kind of materiality is, is anything but immaterial. You know, the computer screen is made up of, of, of numerous raw materials, each with its own complex history. So the kind of concrete, the concrete becomes entangled in this kind of new history. Um, and again, that sort of mutation and the kind of elasticity of the material um, was something that we've, I've been really interested in. Um, and figuring out how does, um, you know, the kind of the agency of an object and the agency of a building or the remains of a building. And how do objects speak or how does a building speak? Or maybe not even how does the building speak, but how might we listen to it? And what devices might we use to listen to these buildings and these objects? Um, so yeah, if we go to the next next slides, this is um, got a series of kind of student work. An historic building that should be preserved or just an eyesore. It's an argument that campaigners who want to save Birmingham's old library have had before and lost, but they're not easily put off. It's a shame to lose the building anyway. It's only 40 years old and it's, it's worth keeping. Even back in the 70s, the then new concrete skyline was controversial. There are great buildings, bright new streets, but how do you feel affection for them? Where's the warmth of the old Brum? Oh, sorry, I'll go back to that. So, so each student was allocated a digitised concrete fragment at the beginning of the pro project from which they began their, their investigation, um, which was kind of rooted in speculative design, kind of open-ended experimentation. Um, so we ran workshops where students had to use the space of their desktop as a site in which to evidence, combine, record, document, and the, the kind of the desktop screen itself providing a kind of a, an architecture uh, within which to operate. Um, and I think what's kind of interesting about using these, these kind of the desktop recording is that a building such as the Central Library kind of has always felt out of time and maybe out of place, I, I would argue. Um, and where we, it's possible to see brutalism not just as a as a kind of an architectural epoch, but as a speculative design device through which we can reimagine the future. Um, the way that the desktop screen allows us to start to layer and, and kind of develop these kind of ideas of bricolage, I suppose, and kind of layer and stacking um, provides a way for us to think about time, not just as something that's linear, but that exists vertically where past, presence and futures coexist simultaneously. Um, yeah, so I think this kind of some really kind of some really great examples here of students that were that were kind of you know really playing with that idea of, of, of the kind of mutatability of the object um, and and kind of stacking up um, in a kind of as a as a sort of yeah digital palimpsest of of the of the site. Um, yeah, and then yeah, so if we. I think as our, as our cities become smarter, 
Um, and we find ourselves increasingly out of sync with the speed and flow of information that's come to define this kind of experience of the urban landscape. I think Mike mentioned earlier this idea of like dis disorientation um, and this kind of uh, this sense of dislocation um, that is kind of present within within our kind of urban landscapes and also a sense of haunting. Um, you know, the, there's a, the idea that kind of images haunt us. Uh, we know that an image can haunt us. It has, they, they can have an eerie quality to them. Um, but what we're seeing is with, with 3D scanning and the developments around 3D scanning is that kind of this idea of the representational image has been replaced by the replica. So it's kind of shifted into the 3D model as the replica um, is, is a kind of, is a takeover of sorts. Um, and, you know, as we mentioned, Madden's original plan was to build the library from Portland stone, which is a completely different material. The concrete was never intended. Uh, it's the kind of result of budget cuts. So, you know, within the concrete, with it embedded within the kind of coarse aggregate and cement is the kind of potential of another material. So you could kind of argue that this, that these kind of digitized fragments are the embodiment of this potentiality. Um, and what I was really interested in here is the students that were kind of treating um, the, the fragment and really playing with the kind of this, the sort of surface, um, the kind of skin. Um, and, and not where the surface and skin become something that's superficial, but where it's, you know, where it's kind of able to bring depth and texture. Um, and there's kind of something almost kind of psychedelic. I think it's kind of Mark Fisher at the end of uh, Capitalist Realist talks about the need for um, sort of psychedelics in imagining alternative futures to the one we inhabit and kind of develop this through his unfinished writing on, on an uh, acid communism. Um, but yeah, thinking of this kind of idea of a, of a sort of haunting and of a kind of psychedelic surface that might be imprinted into um, sort of speculative future landscapes. Um, and the students were operating through this project as a, as a kind of fictional design group called the Agency for Speculative Architecture. So they were working in small collaborative teams um, and allow it and, and kind of really just sort of playing with the material to explore how fiction in particular has the potential to produce new modes of reality. Um, and if the idea of representing reality is an impossible challenge in itself. Um, so yeah, I think... Yeah, so as we know, kind of concrete is this kind of composite material composed of coarse aggregates that are bonded together with fluid cement and hardens over time. Um, and there's kind of something in that which I think is interesting in, in if we think of like so something like Ursula Kayla Gunn's idea of the carrier bag theory of fiction, this idea of how maybe a, a, a sort of a concrete fragment or this kind of concrete itself, either as its digital or as its physical form, might start to contain or carry um, other narratives within it. Uh, here students were really interested in the relationship between hip hop and, and kind of brutalist architecture um, and used the concrete fragment in a very different way to the other groups where they were less, um, yeah, kind of concerned with kind of thinking of that fragment, let's say architecturally and, and kind of a, in a traditional sense, I guess, but where they were thinking about its connections and its relation to kind of um, sort of um, cultural and creative forms of expression um, and where they were able to then again sort of adapting that kind of glitch aesthetic um, that we've kind of mentioned earlier and that's kind of existed in some of the other projects but also using the Instagram feed and really thinking about the kind of that feed and that flow um, as, as, an, as again as another form of architecture. I think one of the things I'm kind of really interested in is how we can uh, kind of reclaim different digital platforms in various forms as a, as a means to, to kind of to talk about you know our, the, the work that we that we're making um, and then finally this work was presented at, at um, Eastside Projects as part of the duplicate publishing fair um, so students presented their work collaboratively collectively um, and used kind of all perspectives of the, or kind of, you know, really played with the different perspectives of the space. So projections went up to the ceiling, uh, onto the walls, flat screen monitors were laid out on the floor as if they were a kind of an open page, like an open spread of a book. Uh, iPads were dotted around the space to allow for a kind of tactile interaction. 
Um, and I think what was interesting was noticing how other people were coming into the space and starting to interact with those pro um, projections um, and, and to kind of in the same way that they might interact with a building or a site, there was a kind of an interaction with, with this, the kind of the architecture of that space as well. Um, so yeah, that was the kind of concrete.rip project. Um, and then, yeah, I thought maybe it's kind of, it, it's interesting to, to kind of, to leave you all with a, a kind of provocation. Um, so and that, and that of the kind of the, the sort of the architectural copy. Um, and we can see traces obviously of the Boston City Hall and the Birmingham City Library. Um, and a few years ago, Mechanu Architects uh, won the commission to design the Tainan Public Library in Taiwan. Um, and they kind of pitched and were successful with this, again, kind of inverted ziggurat um, structure. Now, Mechanu have also built, um, are famous for building um, Europe's largest public library, which is in Birmingham, which is the library that effectively replaced Madin's central library. Um, and I think it's really interesting to see this kind of like this kind of re-emergence and the similarity of this kind of form, um, but in a very different location and how that maybe provides a space to speculate um, on the kind of the potential for the Birmingham Central Library to have been consumed by the internet, to have been, to, to now be reassembling offline. Um, Hito Stahl talk we've mentioned a few times, but talks about the internet, not that we've, be, not that the internet, that everything has moved online, but the, the internet has moved offline. Um, perhaps this is an example of the building, you know, sort of at one point being consumed through these digital fragments and now being reassembled in an offline uh, mode in Tainan, all via time travelling to London for the game. Um, and Boris Groys says uh, that fiction becomes reality when it enters reality, when the psychological conflicts described by art lead to revolutionary action. Before this revolutionary moment, realist fiction remains a fiction. So what else might be reformed and reassembled? And can the, a utopian idea be reborn as a sort of sticky slime or mutant shape-shifting surface functioning as both a universal and specific um, kind of form of utopia? Um, but yeah, that's like maybe a speculative provocation for, for, to leave you with and for people to, to kind of think about um, themselves. And this is an art biography. So it's, it's open access. So you can kind of see our, our workings and our references as well. Uh, so we'll, we'll leave that up for the viewing kind of, you've got the link there below. Okay, that's it. Thanks. We've, we've also, we've tried to put um, a chat that runs through as well with various quotes and links as we've been going along. So if, if people want to go into the chat there, uh, you can, you can kind of save the chat. Zoom allows you to do that, exports it out as a, as a kind of text document. Um, but also kind of, yeah, there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there of links and kind of quotes and different things that we've been talking about as we've been going along. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Um, we've got uh, we're kind of quite close to our, our being out of time, but we, if people have questions, then maybe just alert me in the, the chat box and I will pitch them uh, to our fantastic speakers. Um, I mean, I was interested in do you see, uh, uh, I, could, I could see some resonances with the kind of activities you've been describing and the, the things happening, say, in Milton Keynes, kind of over the last kind of five, ten years, um, you, know, you know, both Sam Jacobs' work kind of as, you know, it would be initiated in the Clockwork Jerusalem show at Venice and, and then more recently the MK Gallery. Um, and the, the 6A produced and, the, and the, the show, the opening show there, which all of which are sort of seem to have been activities directed at um, somehow reimagining the utopianism of, that, the, of, of the, the work from the 60s and, um, and kind of, uh, yeah, awakening its sort of latent power. I mean, is that for you, is, 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 do you see is is a, is one of the, the the motivations behind what you're doing a desire for the residents of Birmingham to rediscover their city in in uh, in, a, in a way that maybe they'd they'd lost sight of? I I'd say yes. I think it definitely is. I think um, the the idea of this is is I mean, in a lot of ways it's quite a retrospective uh, take on a moment of passing in the city where. 
a lot of those very bold visions that were very much focused on the human experience of the city and, and an improving condition. A lot of those moments that are incredibly laden with memories, but also with carbon, are now being um, uh, lost. And there's not a huge amount of dialogue. I mean, I think the kind of things that we're showing here are an attempt, are attempts to try and open up dialogue in public, and we mean that as a as a as a kind of fruitful and honest um, set of questions um, to to the citizens of Birmingham. And, and I think that, that trying to um, revisit some of the civic qualities of the city that were really imbued really, well, I guess from the, from the 19th century onwards, really. I mean, a lot of my research as part of my PhD is about that, the civic ground of the city, which arguably Birmingham might in, in the 20th century is not necessarily renowned for, for notions of the civic ground other than kind of grand civic municipal projects. But we're really interested in in how the social aspects of the city can be revealed and, and celebrated and and maybe that some of the character the the language of the city from that from that very bold period can actually start to figure in in new works of architecture and new works of art that, that emerge from the city <laughs>